Good afternoon, I'm Bruce Luckham from the National Security College here at the ANU. I'm fortunate enough today to be talking to Dr. Amy Seabright, who's a Senior Advisor and Director in the Southeast Asia Program from CSIS in Washington DC, and she's an expert on East Asian security. Good afternoon, Amy. Good afternoon. Um, if I could start off with an obvious question, um, regional reactions to President Trump. I know that under ex-President Obama, uh, the US put a lot of effort into developing relations with uh, Southeast and Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. although there was still a little bit of a worry about the sustainability of that US commitment. How do you think the, uh, the rise in the uh, presidency of Donald Trump is playing into those regional dynamics? Yeah, I think there is some anxiety. As you mentioned, there was already anxiety in the Obama administration about our staying power, our commitment. Um, and, um, you know, I think a couple of things have caused some regional anxiety about a Trump administration. One is what he said in the campaign about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, and then of course on day one he withdrew the United States from the TPP. So I think that sends a very worrisome strategic signal to the region about U.S. commitment towards economic leadership in the region and broad, more broadly strategic leadership and engagement with the region. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, President Trump has signaled that he wants to build a larger military and in some of his comments related to China, the South China Sea, it sounds like he, he does want to have a focus on regional stability in this, in this region. So I think a lot of, of dynamics will have to play out before um, countries in the region really know how he's going to deal with close alliances in the region and emerging partnerships. But another thing that's caused, I think, a little bit of concern is we have, that the region has not yet heard from President Trump anything about Southeast Asia or ASEAN or very much about India um, and some of those other uh, regional issues uh, or frameworks that are not just our key allies in, the, in Northeast Asia and the issue with China. So I think uh, there's, there's going to be a, a lot of interest over the next several weeks once his administration gets filled out to hear what the leadership of his administration have to say about regional dynamics. Okay, can I pick up, you mentioned TPP. Um, one of the things I think it's fair to say uh, about the pivot, regionally it was seen as quite military centric um, and the TPP, this is leaving aside private sector activity, but at sort of a more government to government level, uh, the TPP was seen as, the, as I guess the centerpiece of US economic engagement in the region. Now, how do you think that has gone down in Asia, leaving aside the direct economic impacts, but the symbolism of his first day in office, he sort of uh, puts a, an arrow through it? I think it's devastating. It's devastating to U.S. credibility in the region. I mean, after all, the United States led the negotiations yeah. on TPP for five years, and TPP partners put a lot of things on the table including things that were very difficult for them in terms of their you know, domestic political situation um, for the TPP. And then now with this new president, you know, we're turning our backs on this agreement and really on our TPP partners. Um, and beyond that, a lot of countries in the region had really pinned their hopes on TPP, even those that were not current signatories. So countries like, um, well, economies like Taiwan, and South Korea and Indonesia and the Philippines. I mean, all of these countries had really hoped to join the TPP in the next stage and saw that as really pivotal to their economic future. And they want to see a region that's led by the United States and kind of a high, um, high level of, of rules and standards. So I think it's, it, it's in a, a, a really uh, terrible message and I think it has done real strategic damage to our position in Asia. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I still think there's a very strong logic behind TPP in terms of the economic benefits to the American people and American companies and the strategic benefits. So, you know, we're, uh, so I hope that at some point in this administration they will find a way to come back to TPP and fix whatever they're unhappy with, but, but put it back on the table. How much has the failure to get the TPP through given sort of a, a free run to China in the sense that they're obviously very <coughs> aggressive bilaterally but also multilaterally yeah. through One Belt, One Road, um, our set regional comprehensive economic partnership, they're sort of instrumental in pushing that. You could argue that 
by the US sort of at least temporarily sort of pulling back economically from from the region the, in a government sense, it's sort of given the Chinese a bit of a free pass, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think in this kind of strategic vacuum now on economic leadership, China is certainly going to step in and fill that void. So, um, so in that sense, it really has created tremendous strategic space for China in terms of leading discussions on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, and some of the other economic initiatives, the One Belt, One Road and other things. You know, at the same time, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. Yeah. So, you know, even if we had had TPP enacted, um, we could very well have seen RCEP come into play. And they're just very different agreements with, um, you know, to some degree different memberships and they uh, will accomplish different things. So it's, again, it's not a zero-sum game. We can have RCEP. Um, the bigger problem in my eyes is that we don't have a TPP. Yeah. So at a time when countries are going to be looking to integrate around standards that are going to be yeah. put forth by RCEP and other trade arrangements, the United States is left out of that and it's not going to be the high standards that would really benefit not only American companies and American workers, um, but, but the region as a whole, in my view, because the region as a whole will do much better if they integrate in terms of, you know, more open economies and high standards that will really continue to attract investment and, 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 efficient, and, and high productivity in the years to come. Could I ask you to gaze into a crystal ball um, in the sense that with the current uncertainties, there are various paths or options the countries, particularly the smaller ones in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. could, could follow. They could try and get ASEAN a bit more um, proactive. Mm -hmm. They could try and form alliances or alliance is the wrong word, but, but move closer to some of the larger partners, or they could fall more into China's ambit, as arguably the Philippines has. Or they could do nothing and just sit and wait and see what, it, and see what happens over the ensuing months. How do you think, or is it possible to discern a sort of regional reaction, or likely regional reaction, or is it too soon to No, I do think it's too soon to tell. Um, I think we'll have to wait and see how uh, the Trump administration and their Asia, their approach to Asia, how that plays out and how it's received. I mean, certainly um, withdrawing from TPP does not help, but um, we still have, uh, the United States still has very strong security partnerships with many allies and, and partners in the region. It's, you know, the United States is still, to a large degree, the security partner of choice for many of these countries, and we've seen tremendous, remarkable progress in our security relationships with countries like India and Vietnam in recent years, for example, and, and continued progress on stronger partnerships like we have with Singapore and allies like Japan and Australia and others. So, um, but you know, countries in this region, um, small Southeast Asian countries, have long um, calculated uh, how to balance their very strong economic relationship with China and their very strong security partnership with the United States and others in the region. And that calculation is, is always prone to shifts when there are domestic political transitions, so new people come in to power, as we saw President Duterte in the Philippines, and they come in with a different view or a different approach, or they want to try something different. Um, and so I, it's natural to see that sort of ebb and flow of countries moving closer to the China orbit and, you know, maybe moving back closer to the United States or working, having more of a focus on their ASEAN partnerships and really trying to build up strength and resilience in ASEAN and then kind of giving up for a while thinking that that's too difficult and moving back towards more of a focus on their larger uh, partners. So I think those dynamics are pretty natural and normal and they'll continue but um, but I think it's incumbent on the Trump administration to show up in the region you know come to Southeast Asia President Trump needs to go to the APEC summit in Vietnam and the East Asia summit in the Philippines and engage with Southeast Asian partners and um, General Mattis now uh, Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State when if Rex Tillerson is confirmed they need to come out to the region and show that they remain a hundred percent committed to building up those kind of partnerships and that really I think will go a long way towards you know keeping US engage you know keeping a kind of a really productive relationship with the United States in many of these countries okay just one final question before I let you go back to the conference yeah. um, if you had to give advice to our policymakers over here, given the particular uncertainties in Southeast Asia, what would it be in terms of how we can 
sort of perhaps even fill some of the vacuum the U.S. leaves in the short term? Well, even, um, you know, putting the President Trump, um, yeah. the Trump administration aside, I think that the, the fact that Australia has such strong partnerships with so many countries in the region, in Southeast Asia, for example, um, uh, it, it's always helpful to have um, those partnerships continue to build and strengthen. So a good example of that is the Philippines. You know, President Duterte has really signaled he's wanted to sort of move away a little bit from the United States and the, U the security alliance uh, that we have with the Philippines. So it's an excellent time for Australia, which may be the closest country after the United States in terms of a security partnership to step in and do as much as possible in terms of building partner capacity, engaging with the Philippine Armed Forces and some joint exercises and training since you know Australia is the only other country outside the United States that has a, a, a reciprocal agreement or an agreement for visiting forces. Um, and, and doing those kinds of things I think is tremendously helpful and valuable. And then um, you know if President Duterte and President Trump rebuild a relationship and he invites the United States back in to the same level of security cooperation we had before. That's terrific, but you know, having Australia there is only, you know, it's 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 a, it's just a multiplier effect. So, I think uh, the more that Australia can do with key partners, including Japan, yeah. the kind of strategic partnership that you're building with Japan is it sends a very strong signal to the region, and in the long run, will have a, a very powerful effect. And then, of course, all of us are building closer ties with India. Yeah. And so I think all of that, you know, the more that Australia can do um, with or without the United States yeah. under the Trump administration, but the more that Australia can do to build partnerships in the region, the better for all of us.